the family of First Baptist Church, Indian Trail, welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for the generosity of your people. Thank you for their willingness to give because, Lord, we realize we wouldn't have anything had you not given it to us. It all belongs to you anyway. And so, Father, we're returning it now. Lord, and I pray that you'll multiply it. And, Lord, let our community, let these ministries know that we're in this together to make a difference in people's lives, to make a difference in this world, to show the love of Jesus tangibly so that, God, these moms and these women and these children could all know that they're not alone, that there are people that care about them and that love them, and specifically First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Use it for your glory, your honor, and bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, do you remember when you got saved? Do you remember when you gave your life to Jesus? Well, three of you do. Huh? Do you have the assurance one of these days that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? Boy, here's an old song that I think will bless you. Oh, hallelujah. Stand with us when you can and let's sing. Sing this out. Blessed assurance. Come on. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Heir of salvation. Purchase of God. Born of His Spirit. Born of His Spirit.
let's continue to worship him, amen. Let's just worship the Lord this morning. I think you're gonna know this one. Sing with us. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Sing it out. Let's sing Waymaker. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are the way maker. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are.
Now, what does a, an old worn out Baptist preacher do after hearing music like this glorious choir and orchestra and musicians and taranda? And then after the man who stands here to preach Sunday by Sunday by Sunday by Sunday like few men will ever preach in this country, what does a guy like me do after all of that? Well, you just have to do what you have to do. And I have had a lot of experience doing what I have to do. When I was a teenage boy, my mom had a curfew on me. And you others had a curfew on you by your mom. I had to be in at 12 o'clock at night. And so on a night I was coming in, I had my shoes in my hand, I was tiptoeing through the hallway, and my mama woke up. It was two o'clock in the morning. My mama said, is that you, Jerry? I said, yes, mama. What time is it? I said, it's 12 o'clock, mama. And about that time, our cuckoo clock cuckooed <laughs> two times. So I just stood there and cuckooed 10 more times. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to do what you have to do, Pastor Mike. You know what I'm saying. So thank you, dear, dear friends. I love uh, your pastor and Kathy and love all of your staff. It's just a joy to be here on this special day. Now, I want you to turn in your Bible to a very familiar verse. You probably wouldn't even need to turn, but for my purpose this morning, I would like for you to have it in front of you. So if you would look to the uh, Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the third chapter, and uh, then when you get to John chapter three, look right on down there to verse 16. And uh, you follow in your Bible as I read this verse for us, then keep your Bible open to that place as we'll go down through it this morning. John chapter three, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In the 1870s, archeologists uncovered in the sands of Egypt, a, a giant red granite shaft. They named it Cleopatra's Needle. Shortly thereafter, they decided that they would give it to the city of London. And so they gave it to London and they erected it along the banks of the Thames River. They decided that they would put at the base of the shaft a, a time vault and would put in that time vault some of the memorabilia of that particular day. And so they put in some uh, uh, toys of little boys and girls. They put in some coins. Uh, they put in some clothing, they put uh, articles of, of newspapers and things like that. And then it was decided that they would uh, uh, get a committee to select the greatest verse in all of the Bible and put that uh, verse of scripture in the time vault. And so the committee was unanimous and they put in the 222 languages of the world at that time, John 3, 16. Well, to my mind, that is exactly correct. I would call it the greatest verse in all of the Bible. There are probably many of you mothers this morning on your special day, and you have taught your boys and girls John 3, 16. It could very well be the first verse that all of us learned, and it could very well be the last verse that all of us learn, uh, that all of us forget. Hardly a verse in all of the Bible like this verse. Have you ever thought about it? If you lost all of the verses in the Bible, but this verse you would have enough in this verse right here to save anybody and everybody in the whole world who wants to be saved. Some have called it the inexhaustible uh, verse. Uh, you could just preach it and preach it and preach it and never exhaust its meaning. Uh, I heard about a young man named Henry Moorhead who uh, the evangelist D.L. Moody met when he was over in England. He was impressed with him and he said to the young man, uh, if you're ever in America, come to Chicago and preach in my Moody church. Well, much to his surprise, just a few days later, uh, he got a, a wire that said, I have landed in New York, I'll be coming to preach for you. Well, he decided he'd better do what he said he would do. So he let the young man preach for several different nights 
And the unusual thing about it is every night he preached on John 3, 16, the crowds grew bigger and bigger and multitudes of people were saved. Now here's the exciting, the unusual thing about it. He began to preach when he was 16 years of age. He preached until he died at age 33. And he never used another text in the Bible except John 3, 16. It was a different sermon every time, but it was always from this same verse of Scripture, the inexhaustible verse. Do you remember that gospel song that we used to hear? Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. If I had a thousand lives, if I had a thousand tongues, I could never exalt the, exhaust the meaning of John 3, 16. But it's also been called everybody's verse. It is a verse so profound that the scholars cannot plumb its depths. It is so simple and so beautiful that little boys and girls can understand it and be saved. It is a verse for everybody. It is a verse for every man and for every woman. It is a verse for the rich and for the poor. It is a verse for the educated and the uneducated. It is a verse for the fathers, but especially on this day, it is a verse for the mothers. And so I want to talk to you this morning about every mother's verse, everybody's verse, John 3, 16. I'm going to just make a few simple statements about the love of God out of these verses of Scripture. If you don't get anything else that I say this morning, I want you to walk out of this room, mother. I want you to walk out of this room, dad. I want you to walk, walk out of this room, everybody in this room saying, God loves me. Well, the first statement is found in the first phrase here. For God so loved the world. Uh, what that means is, is that God's love is uh, global. For God so loved the world. The subject of the verb love there is God. Have you noticed that the Bible never ever makes uh, an attempt to describe or to, to explain or to prove the existence of God? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There are some truths that are what we call innate truths. You're just born knowing that they are so. And one of those innate truths is the truth that there is a God who exists. Proverbs 14, 1 says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now we know a lot of things about God that are taught in our Bible. A God is omnipresent, that means he's everywhere. God is omniscient, that means God knows everything. God is omnipotent, that means God has all power. But the basic fundamental assertion about God is in 1 John 4, 8, where it says, God is love. If you don't know anything else about God, you need to know this morning that God is a God of love. But now look at the verb here for a moment. It says, for God so loved the world. Now, we use the word love in a lot of different ways, don't we? Uh, you know, I, I love football. Uh, I love peanut butter. Uh, I love my wife. I love my mother. We use it in a lot of different ways. But uh, the word love uh, is a very particular word in this verse. There are three basic words for uh, love in the Greek language. There is the word eros. We get our word erotic, and, and that means a sensual kind of love. So odious is that word that it was never planted one time in the, in the sweet soil of Holy Scriptures. And then, of course, there is that word philos. You know, we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Uh, it is a social kind of love, a fraternal kind of love. That's not the word that is used here. But the word that is used here is the word agape. And what it means is a spiritual love, a love to the highest degree. God doesn't love you with erotic love. God doesn't love you with mere brotherly love. God loves you with agape love. Uh, in Jeremiah 31, verse 3, uh, God says, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, 
And the Hebrew word there, translated everlasting, literally means from vanishing point to vanishing point. You know what that means? That means there was never a time in eternity past that God didn't love you. There will never be a time in eternity future that God will not love you. God loves you with a from vanishing point to vanishing point love. My wife, Janet, happy Mother's Day, Janet. She's watching me preach. Happy Mother's Day, Janet. And, and uh, you know, my, my, my wife, Janet, we've got, four, uh, uh, we've got four children and we've got seven grandchildren. Uh, you say, somebody, have I shown you the pictures of my grandchildren? No, and I sure do appreciate it. But anyhow, uh, she, 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 Janet used to get our little grandchildren and she would say to them, I loved you before you were born. And on an occasion, our granddaughter Ashlyn was there and uh, she crawled up in uh, Meemaw's lap and she cupped her little hands under Meemaw's face and she said, Meemaw, I loved you before you were born. <laughs> well, that's not exactly true, but you get the meaning. Ladies and gentlemen, in eternity past, before God created the world, he loved you. Before uh, Columbus came and discovered America, he loved you. Before you were born, God loved you. And in eternity past, there will never be a time when God will not love you. For God so loved the world. But oh, don't miss that little pronoun right before the verb love. For God so loved. And what it means is in such an overwhelming way. You see, God loves you with a, an overwhelming uh, kind of love. God's love for you is not a trickling stream. It's a flooding river. Uh, God's love is, is not a, a dripping faucet. Uh, it's a gushing fountain. God's love is not a blinking lightning bug. God's love is a blinding sun for God so loved. But then notice what it says. It says, for God so loved the world. It's our, where we get our word cosmos. Uh, the word world is used in several ways in the Bible. Uh, sometimes it refers to the world of nature, God's beautiful world of nature. There are times that the word is used to describe a godless world system that organizes itself in hostility to God. But in this particular verse of scripture, it means God's world of people. It means God loves all the people of the whole wide world. Now, that's an overwhelming thought this morning. Uh, they tell us that there are seven plus billion people in uh, the world. And the Bible teaches that God loves every one of those seven plus billion people in all of the world. I, I had a preacher friend a number of years ago who had a wife, uh, had a mother in his church who had 10 children. He was talking to her on an occasion and, and he said to her, he said, you've got 10 children, I know you love them all, but, but do you ever find there's so many of them that, that if you're not careful, you will neglect one of them? And here was the classic mother's answer. She said, oh no, I don't ever forget a one of them. They're all precious to me. And my friend learned something about a mother's heart. You see, a mother's heart does not, uh, does not operate by the laws of division. One mother's heart divided 10 ways. A mother's heart uh, operates by the laws of multiplication. One mother's heart multiplied 10 ways. Well, oh dear one, when God loves the world, it doesn't mean just one God's heart multiplied seven billion ways. It means one heart of God multiplied seven plus billion ways. Line them all up. Seven plus billion of the people and let them march in front of God. And God says, I love you, Bill. I love you, Sue. I love you, Tom. I love you, Mary. And mother, when you come in front of God this morning, God looks at you with an overwhelming, unbelievable, unimaginable love. And God said, I love you. I was preaching on the love of God a number of years ago. And at the invitation time, a young a girl, college age maybe, maybe a young mother. 
And uh, she walked down to me in the invitation and there were big tears uh, welling up in her eyes. And she said, preacher, are you telling me that God really loves me? And I said, yes, yes, I'm telling you God really loves you. And tears flowed down her cheek as she walked away rejoicing in the love of God. Mother, God's love is global. God loves the whole world. You say, well, that, that, that's wonderful, preacher, to know that God loves the whole world, but that doesn't move me. Uh, that doesn't really touch me. Uh, come in a little bit closer then. In, in Ephesians 5.25, it says what? Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. If you are a born again child of God sitting in this room this morning, I'm here to announce to you that God loves you. You say, well, that's a little better, but preacher, that doesn't quite do it. And uh, so come a little closer. Uh, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but, but Christ loves me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It was like it was on this Sunday morning I was in Sunday school and they were singing little, uh, little songs for boys and girls. And we came to a song like this. I, I've never forgotten it. I was just a little boy. We began to sing uh, a, a song uh, there. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. And at the top of my little voice on the refrain, I sang, I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Aren't you glad that God loves you this morning? His love is a global love, but now move quickly. Uh, the second thing I want to say about God's love for you is that God's love is sacrificial. Look at the second phrase, for God so loved the world global, that he gave his only begotten son. God's love is sacrificial. Now, love is a decision. You decide to love. Oh, no, oh, I know love's an emotion, too. I, I'm not saying there's not emotion in love. You remember when you were just in elementary school and you got that first little taste of puppy love? You know what I mean, that little puppy love? Be careful, that can lead to a dog's life, but, but you, you, you know what I'm saying? When, when I used to go to camp with our boys and girls in Jacksonville, I'd, I'd quote a little poem for them that went like this. Love's a very funny thing. It's shaped just like a lizard. It wraps its tail around your throat and goes right through your gizzard. You know what I'm talking about. Love is an emotion, but, but basically love is a decision. You decide to love uh, someone. Uh, you, you see, mom, you decided to love that old boy, your husband, uh, never imagining that his hair would fall out and that his teeth would need to be replacing and that he snored uh, in bed. And uh, sir, you decided to love her, never imagining that uh, she would bite her toenails and eat peanut butter and jelly in bed. <laughs> but you decided to love them. Can I get an amen out there in the crowd? <laughs> well, God made a decision. God decided to love. For God so loved the world that he gave. Uh, there's uh, volumes in that word gave there. It, it means that God gave his son up definitely. I, I can imagine in the halls of eternity that God knew that we were going to be sinners and that we would need a savior. And so God searched heaven. He looked at the cherubim and the seraphim. He looked at the uh, archangels and the angels to find someone worthy to die for our sins. And his gaze falls upon the Lord Jesus and in the halls of eternity, the Godhead decides Jesus will come down and be the savior of the world. I can almost imagine when Jesus left heaven. I can hear the angels as they say, don't go down there, Jesus. They'll misunderstand you and insult you. Don't go down there. And he comes on down. And he goes by Jupiter and Jupiter says, don't go down there, Jesus. They'll call you a glutton and a, and a drunkard. Don't go down there, Jesus. And down, down, down he comes. And he comes by the sun. And the sun said, don't go down there, Jesus. They'll drive rusty nails into your hands. They'll thrust a spear into your side. Don't go down there, Jesus. 
and yet out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe, only his great eternal love made our Savior go to our filthy little world, to a dirty little manger, to be born, to die for the sins of the whole world. He, he gave him definitely. He gave him uniquely. This is a whole series of sermons here when he says his only begotten son. And the word there means one of a kind. He gave his son uniquely. You know, every birth, uh, every birth is a miracle. You do understand that, don't you? When, when I was a pastor in Mobile, Georgia, uh, Mobile, Alabama, a number of years ago, I had a, uh, a doctor in our church who had delivered at that time several thousand uh, babies. And I used to take him to lunch, and I used to say, now, Dr. Mitchell, uh, explain biological birth to me. And he'd start telling me about it and all those big words, you know, and I'd sit there acting like I understood what they meant. And when he got through, I'd look at him and he'd look at me. We were aware that we were in the presence of a miracle. Mom, do you remember when you first looked into the face of that precious little baby? <laughs> and you were aware that you were a part of a miracle. But Jesus' birth is the miracle of all miracles. Jesus was uniquely his only begotten son, one of a kind. No baby ever born like that, born of a virgin. You see, he had to be born of a virgin because he could not have been the sinless sacrifice for our sins if he had been tainted with original sin. So when Jesus was born, the Holy Spirit short-circuited the sin cycle so that Jesus was the only one born who was older than his mother and as old as his father. He's the only one ever born who had a heavenly father but no heavenly mother, who had an earthly mother but no earthly father. He was born uniquely. But now notice he was also born not only uniquely, not only sacrificially, but, but, but he was born uh, marvelously. Uh, you know, we would have done it different if we'd, had the, if we'd scripted the birth of Jesus, wouldn't we? Why, we would have had Jesus born in an elaborate condo in the Trump Towers. God had his son born in a little village called uh, uh, Bethlehem. We would have placed Jesus on the soft silk pillars of a king's palace. God put him on the coarse straw in a smelly manger. And yet wise men came to worship him. Shepherds came to praise him. And God in heaven was pleased with him. God's love is sacrificial. But notice, for God so loved that he gave. There, there's a, a verse that connects to that, Romans 8:32. In Romans 8, 32, it says, if God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. It's the same root word as gave here, but there's a little preposition added to it. God gave him, but he gave him up. Well, what did God give Jesus up to? Well, he gave him up to scourging like no man's ever been scourged. It was like they plowed deep furrows, uh, furrows down his heart. God gave him up to, to Calvary where Jesus suffered like no one ever suffered. Why was Jesus suffering like that? He was suffering so that he might shed his blood to pay for your sins and mine and God proved his love at Calvary. Romans chapter five, verse eight. God, here it is, commendeth. The word means God declared, God proved. His love. In other words, Jesus and his shed blood on the cross of Calvary, God was proving his love. When uh, I was uh, in elementary school, I got a crush on Corinne, Corinne Cunningham. And I wanted Corinne to love me so much. And so I would get a dandelion now, you, you have to explain some of this stuff to kids. For instance, when I'm talking on marbles, I say, okay, kids, a marble's a little round thing like that that we used to play. And, and so when I talk about a, dan a dandelion, kids, uh, is a little flower that's got petals on it. Can you identify? Anybody in here now know where I'm headed? Uh-huh, some of you old folks, I see. I wanted Corrine Cunningham to love me so bad 
I'd get me a dandelion. I'd say, she loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. And if the last petal was what you wanted it to be, it would say, she loves me. You know what? I rigged it. <laughs> but you know what? When you want to know whether or not God loves you, he didn't have to rig it. Every drop of blood that fell from the Lord Jesus on Calvary says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. God's love is global. God's love is sacrificial. God's love is personal. Now watch this. That whosoever believeth in him. Now that gets personal. You see, the, 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 the verb, uh, the first verb in this verse, God is the subject of the verb. Uh, there is a side of the, the divine sovereignty of, of God. But now the subject of believe here is the word whosoever. Uh, and what it's saying here is that God's love is, is whosoever. What a magnificent word is this word whosoever. Whosoever. Who does that mean, preacher? It means whosoever. It means anybody in the whole world. When God uses that word, he just rolls out the carpet to heaven and he says, anybody who wants to be can be saved. Isn't that glorious this morning? Oh, mama, mama. He loves you, whosoever. Any mama who wants to be saved, you can be saved, and I pray you will in this service. Anybody in this room who wants to be saved today, you can be saved, whosoever. You know, I'm, I'm glad that, that, that God didn't put my name there. I'm glad that God didn't say that if Jerry Vines believes in me. When I was uh, living in Rome, Georgia, a number of years ago, I got a letter from the city water department. And it said that I wasn't paying my water bill. And it's fixing to cut off my water. Well, that was interesting to me because I had dug a well, I had my own water. I wasn't using their nasty water. <laughs> you know what I found out? I found out that there was another rascal in that town named Jerry Vines and he wasn't paying for his water. Oh, as insecure as I am, if God had put my name there, I'd say it had to be this other uh, Jerry Vines. It, it's not me. So, so God just said, whosoever, anybody who wants to be can be saved. Whosoever. Aren't you glad of that? Whosoever believeth. Now that's how you're saved. Who can be saved? Anybody. How can you be saved? Believe in him, whosoever believeth in him. A good way of translating that uh, is the word uh, of faith. Whoever puts your faith in him, whosoever puts your trust in him. You say, well, that's my problem, pastor. I, I don't have faith. I don't know, have enough faith to be saved. Yes, you do. Uh, you, you have plenty of faith to be, you, you, you couldn't function on a day's basis if you didn't use faith. For instance, in the morning, You'll go into the table and your wife will have your breakfast there and you'll eat your breakfast believing and trusting and having faith that she hadn't poisoned it. <laughs> Isn't that right? And then you will go to the bank and you will deposit that money in the bank trusting and believing that the banker will take care of your money. This afternoon, I will go to the airport. I'll walk on an airplane. I'll sit down. I'll drink me a Coke or whatever, trusting and believing that the pilot is capable of flying me back to Atlanta, Georgia. Faith. See that chair? You thought I was just worn out and going to need to sit down, didn't you? <laughs> now, 
Pastor, that looks like a pretty substantial chair, doesn't it? Doesn't it look to y'all? Okay. In my mind, I'm thinking, I believe that chair is able to hold me up. That's the intellectual decision. You believe Jesus died on the cross, you believe he'd save you, that's the intellectual decision. And then I make an emotional decision. I'm tired. I really do believe that I could get a little rest if I sit in that tire chair. That's the emotional decision. Well, let me ask you a simple question on Mother's Day. Am I sitting in that chair? Am I sitting in the chair right now? What have I got to do? That feels good. Take it, preacher, right on. Fish on. <laughs> now, in just a little while, you're going to be given an opportunity to trust Jesus as your personal Savior. And if you do, He'll save you. Now, here's the last thing I want to say quickly God's love is eternal. Should not Perish. Perish. Oh, oh, what a noxious weed in the sweet garden of Holy Script. Perish. All hell is in that word. Perish. Uh, every time, you, you, you see, hell in the Bible was a a picture of, of uh, the garbage dump of the universe. And what Jesus, who had the tenderest heart that ever beat in a human breast, said, Jesus said that there, there is a place called hell. It is the garbage dump of the universe. Every time you take the garbage can out, uh, it preaches you a sermon about hell. E every time you see a garbage truck come by, it preaches you a sermon about hell. There is a hell should not perish. Oh, don't go to hell. Don't go to hell. Matthew 25, 46 uses the same word eternal. These shall go away into everlasting punishment. I can see Jesus now. And as people walk away toward hell, don't. I, I, I didn't want you to go to hell. I shed my blood on the cross so that you wouldn't go to hell. I didn't mean for you to go there. Don't go to hell. But oh, I like the way the verse changes. Should not perish, but <laughs> have everlasting life. All heaven is in that statement right there. You don't have to go to hell. You can go to a wonderful, wonderful place called heaven. Do you hear the songs of the angels? Do you hear the shouts of the saints of God? Do you see the gates of pearl and the streets of gold? Oh, mom, dad, son, daughter, you can go to a marvelous place called heaven. And it's because of the love of God. As the story goes, there was a children's home, an orphan's home, that had a rather troublesome little child. She was always causing conflict. She was always creating chaos. And they, they just were looking for a way to move her on to some other place. And on a day, they saw that little girl as she made her way across the grass toward a tree. They saw she had something in her hand. She climbed up the tree, deposited a note, and came down from the tree. And they quickly ran out, got up the tree, and they opened up her note. And it said, to anybody who finds this, 
I love you. We're living in a world that treats God like an unwanted orphan child. And yet God, in his love, has written John 3.16, and he says, to anybody who finds this, I love you. Now here's what I want us to do. There are probably some moms in this room, some dads, some single, single, some boys or girls, and you have never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. I'm going to ask your pastor to come, and I'm going to ask him to give an invitation to invite you to respond to the wonderful love of God. Pastor, would you come? Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.